future. Tonight on Greater Boston, it's on to the general election. We'll get into the primary results and the paths ahead, including more than one historic first for the state, a little later in the show with the Globe's Joan Venaki and the Bay State Banner's Yahoo Miller. But first, to the winner of what may have been the most bruising of yesterday's contests for Suffolk County District Attorney. Over the last several weeks, both candidates faced significant controversy. In early August, the Boston Globe piece raised questions about why interim DA Kevin Hayden had not pursued charges against a white transit cop who was accused of pulling a gun on an Hispanic black man during a traffic dispute, then lying about it. Then a couple of weeks later, the Globe again reported that Boston City Council Ricardo Arroyo was twice investigated for possible sexual assault back in 2005 and 2007. Royal denied any wrongdoing, accused Hayden of leaking the details to the media. Now the ballots have been counted, Arroyo is conceded, and without a Republican challenger, Hayden is on his way to a full term. Kevin Hayden joins me. Congratulations, I think, Kevin yeah. <laughs> Hayden, for becoming the permanent DA. Thanks so much for being here. Let's hope so. Thank you, Jim. Good I didn't mean you. permanent, but a full term, I should <laughs> say. You. So why'd you win this? Why do you think the voters chose you over uh, Ricardo Arroyo yesterday? I think ultimately the voters uh, uh, looked at the two of us and looked at who has the experience and the qualifications to do the job. And but, I, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. So, and I and I do. I, I'm built for this. 25 years of experience as a prosecutor, as a criminal defense attorney, and it has having run a state agency previously. Uh, just. But you just, can't deny that some of your vote was a vote against uh, uh, Arroyo because of these charges, not so much for you. You would, you would agree with that, wouldn't you? Well, I, I don't know if I can get in the minds of every single voter. Um, I know that the, the majority of voters spoke and that they chose to elect me, so. You know, it seems to me, if I may be presumptuous, you have two tasks ahead of you. I guess they'd probably be intertwined. One, to do the job, mm -hmm. obviously, and two, to convince the public that they should trust the doer of the job after all the headaches sure. you've had to confront on both sides. You agree with that, I assume, do you? I do, I look forward to the opportunity to do just that. So how do you restore trust? I assume you'd agree that a, you know, a vote count doesn't magically make issues that concern voters disappear. How do you do this trust restoration yeah, thing, District yeah, Attorney? And, and I addressed that last night and I said that I hope that uh, uh, for those who voted for me, thanks for the support, and for those who didn't, I hope that I can uh, work tireless every day to trust and, and, and earn their support uh, by doing my job. I, uh, I'm not a politician, but I am a public servant. Um, and I take that very seriously and I take that to heart. And I think that when uh, the voters see that I am just that, a public servant, that that will uh, gain that trust. Well, you're a politician and a public servant. I mean, you may not like it, but when you have to run for office, by definition, you become politician. I want to reveal, I know you don't want to dwell on the past, but uh, the issues are not totally resolved. Mm -hmm. His campaign, Arroyo's campaign, I think one would argue, I would argue, is brought down by these sexual assault charges. He's accused first you and then your driver, who had been a detective, a cop on the case, whatever, 15 years ago, of having leaked this information. You denied having any involvement with it. Have you spoken to Detective uh, uh, Williams about whether or not he had any involvement in it? I've spoken to him, but not about this particular issue, no. Why would you not ask him if he was the leaker of this information? Well, he was involved in the case and uh, uh, back in the aughts, correct? He, he was. I, I, I know from talking with others, he didn't have any recollection of the case whatsoever. So. And, and it, it, one other thing on this, uh, on the Arroyo situation, he said that an independent investigation was appropriate. Why would you not agree to an independent investigation so there's no there's no trace of well this is Hayden protecting his you know what let an independent force come in if you're right clear you clear the detective and then you move on why wouldn't that be a wise route for you at this stage well I know he's talking um, about uh, bringing up ethic charges yeah. and if he does then we'll, we'll, we'll let that uh, take its course uh, I, I'm confident we've never we cannot release uh, sexual assault files and information in our files ever uh, it's it's a it's a matter of law. We can't do so. Uh, we never have, and we didn't in this case. But he's not asking you to release files. He's asking you to, to investigate the leaks, and they did come from somewhere, obviously. Yes. Yeah. Obviously. I, I don't know where they came from, but I don't believe they came from our office. You know, it, it's, stepping back from Arroyo specifically, these uh, charges against him happened. I'll do my math. 17 and 15 years ago, when he was a teenager. Take Arroyo out of it. There's a 17. There's a kid who's 17 years ago engaged in sexual misconduct. He owns up to it. That was not the situation here. He denies it. He owns up to it. The little I know you, you seem to be a second chance kind of guy. What happens to that kid 
who did some pretty horrible things as a kid, when he's an adult, if he or she, he, whatever, has had a clean record in the intervening years, do they deserve a second chance? Absolutely. Can they be elected to office? They certainly can. Absolutely. Everyone deserves a second chance. People make mistakes, particularly when they're younger. Uh, I, I've always been a, a firm believer in the power of redemption and second chances. It's a matter, it's a matter of owning up to those uh, mistakes and those responsibilities, first and foremost. Uh, denial uh, doesn't get anyone anywhere. But uh, w with acceptance of responsibility and, and with moving forward, absolutely. Talk about your situation just for a minute. And again, another Globe report. I described it a couple of, of minutes ago. Uh, the Globe reported, after having spoken to the lawyer for this transit cop, that your first assistant said that uh, there was, quote, no aptitude to prosecute. You denied that, then said there was a misunderstanding, that the prosecution is not closed, but it is open. Do you have any regrets at all about how you handled either the case itself or the controversy surrounding the case? No, I don't. The case was always open. I think there was a misunderstanding about that comment, um, and it was uh, obviously misconstrued by the attorney who uh, said otherwise in, in an affidavit, but no, I don't. You know, one of the things that drives me nuts, by the way, I should say, and this is not just a function of you, when you're a public official, you used the term before public servant, mm -hmm. my attitude is when a public servant decides to do that thing and ask the public to support them, when there's an issue that matters to the voters, they have an obligation to talk to responsible media. And by the way, I really appreciate you being here. Sure. Neither you or Mr. Mullen, who was involved in the situation, uh, uh, you both declined to speak to the Boston Globe during this initial writing. Why would you not speak to them and answer every single question they have? Yeah, I, I, we did speak to the, the Globe. We both answered. of you did? We both did. Okay, yeah. my apologies. Let's talk about you for uh, your campaign. Uh, well, your, your, not your campaign, but your service as district attorney. The media basically settled on describing you as a centrist status quo candidate. I know you bristle at that. Is that mm. fair? You do, I can say. I do, yeah. Why? why why are you not that centrist status quo candidate? I, because I've never taken a back seat to anyone when it comes to criminal legal reform. Everything that we talk about now when we, when we talk about that, those words, criminal legal reform, I stick my entire career on. Whether it's juvenile diversion, intervention and prevention strategies, working uh, vigorously on uh, uh, reentry and returning citizens to the community, uh, the cornerstones of criminal legal reform that are so now universally accepted, um, I staked my entire career on. And when I did it, quite frankly, uh, people looked at me like I was crazy. Uh, and I've had people comment in that regard. They go, wow, all these things that you did and that you championed and that you stood for back when you were an assistant district attorney uh, under Ralph and Dan Conley. Ralph Martin uh, and Dan Conley. Ralph Martin and Dan Conley. Um, now, now, now people accept as, as, as good and, and just principles. And it's amazing that uh, you took a lot of hits back then for it. But, you know, if I can focus on something people do know about, it, it, you know this, a couple of years ago, the, uh, the uh, ACLU of Massachusetts did a campaign, What a Difference Did the A Makes, mm -hmm. and found that a huge percentage of people didn't know they're elected, didn't know what their jobs were, didn't know they had discretion around prosecution. I would bet if you stopped 100 people in Suffolk County and said, what did Rachel Rollins run on? She mm -hmm. ran on something, some number of crimes, 15 minor crimes that would not be prosecuted. You didn't endorse that. You say you've told me repeatedly in the past, you think operationally you're doing the same thing. You're just not, for, is that a fair uh, statement as to where you are? Somewhat, yeah. Well, explain what is fair. Well, I think that we're focused on those same low level offenses in terms of diversion and alternatives to prosecution. Uh, we're just looking at it on a case by case basis looking at the individuals involved in those cases, and not just the person that's charged, but also the victims and the community that's involved as well, in order to decide what's just and appropriate, um, and not focus so much on charges and what percentage of charges we're not gonna But prosecute. you would agree that that worked for her. The study that came out on this showed that uh, in terms of recidivism and things like that, that was a success, correct? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I, as some claim that it did work, I, I think there's a lot of cases that we don't know what happened with them when it comes to them being not prosecuted, whether they came back or not, I don't know. Okay, so for the average voter, whether they voted for you or not last night, what are the two or three things you want them to stick in their mind, just like I think most of them have stuck that Rollins list in their head? What, are they, what do you want them to know that is gonna be, are gonna be the guiding, uh, not principles, that's too broad, the guiding mechanics of a full term of Kevin Hayden as Suffolk County DA? Sure, um, it's, it's, it really comes down to one. I mean, there's other things that we're gonna focus on, whether it's um, services over sentences in the opioid epidemic, or whether it's gun cases and, and reducing uh, gun violence in our neighborhoods. But at the end of the day, I, I want all of our um, 
community to know uh, that we are going to be truly engaged with our community like never before. Uh, we are going to get involved in intervention and prevention strategies and close collaboration with our community partners like never before. That's why I've committed to a community engagement team, not just one community engagement person. I've hired two so far. We're already looking at uh, other people that will be added to that team. Uh, and we're going to uh, cover Suffolk County like the waters cover the sea in terms of working with our community partners, the ones that care about public safety, the ones that care about our young people and making sure uh, that they're on the right path, the ones that uh, care about our streets being safe. Uh, whether it's our churches, whether it's our 501c3 secular organizations that are committed to these, these, these matters, whatever it may be, we're going to engage with them. We're going to return to community policing and community prosecution like never before. That's going to include the police department. I'm excited about Commissioner Cox. I know he shares my heart around this. And I think that's where we're going to really make the difference. Did you work with him when uh, you were doing what you were doing and he was here uh, through the beginning of his career? I knew of him, not closely, but we've, we've known each other for quite a Okay, let's time. end with a political question, even though you say you're not a politician. Yeah. Uh, Mayor Wu uh, didn't endorse you. Mm -hmm. uh, she endorsed the Royal and then unendorsed the Royal after mm -hmm. these things happen. Do you worry about a working relationship with the mayor of the major part of Suffolk County Not when she was with another candidate? Not at all. Have you uh, spoken to her since uh, your... Uh, we, we spoke today. Uh, How'd that go? She called to congratulate me. It went well. It was not, not a long conversation because we intend to get together again and, and talk some more. Uh, but uh, I, I, I respect her. Um, I know what a, a good leader she is. Uh, and I know that she shares the same heart and passion for our city as I do. Uh, and we're committed to working together to do what's best for the people in Suffolk County. Kevin Hayden, Boston. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Hope you spend a lot of time in that seat in All the right. future. Be well. Thank you. Take appreciate care. it. Take Kevin care. Hayden. Bye bye. While statewide races were not as contentious as that for Suffolk DA, they brought some historic firsts for Massachusetts. In the Democratic Attorney General contest, Boston City Councilor Andrea Campbell defeated Attorney Shannon Liss Reardon, making her the first black woman to ever win a primary contest for a statewide office in our state. And Kim Driscoll's win in the Lieutenant Governor primary means she and Maura Healy, who was the last candidate standing for governor on the Democrat side, could become the first all-woman top two in Massachusetts history. Of course, the winners on the Republican side, that's Jeff Deal and Leah Cole Allen, will be aiming to put that piece on hold. They took round one, but can a Trump-endorsed, Trump-endorsing candidate for governor win in Massachusetts? We'll get to that with a piece of the discussion Marjorie Egan and I had with the Republican nominee earlier today. But first, I'm joined by Boston Globe columnist Joan Bonacchi and Yawo Miller. He's senior editor of the Bay State Banner. It's good to see you both. Thanks for being here. Good to be here. You know, I just spoke to uh, Kevin Hayden, the uh, newly, I guess you'd call it re-elected, but elected for a first term, I should say, a full first term as Suffolk DA. And one of the things I said to him is I said my analysis was he had two jobs. One was to do the DA job, and two was to restore public trust in the guy who does the job, namely Kevin Hayden, after all the nightmares in this campaign. Jones, starting with you, I said, how do you do that? He agreed, and he said, how do you, I said, how do you do that? He said, by just putting my head down and doing the job well or some such thing. Is that enough? Well, I think he is going to have to do a little bit more than that. I think that whole story that the Globe disclosed about how he handled the um, that case involving transit police mm -hmm. is still kind of hanging out there. And um, what he has to show is that he can be tough on police. He promised that he would administer a fair justice system. And that means one where their police aren't treated in a special way. Yeah, well, was it enough for him just to do his job and hope that people take from that that he's the guy to be trusted? Absolutely not. I mean, piggybacking on what Joan said, I think people would want to see, for instance, the uh, the unit that Rachel Rollins, his predecessor, had set up to prosecute cases of uh, misconduct among public officials, including police. He'd want to probably want to see people would probably want to see that work continued. Um, there's that, and then you know the 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 question of whether his office actually leaked information to the Globe about um, two cases in which uh, Ricardo Arroyo's name appeared in in the, in uh, in you know two sexual assault cases in which Ricardo's name uh, you know Arroyo's name appeared. Both of those cases involving minors, 
And I don't think to this point he has said that, you know, he has checked and nobody ha- from his office has accessed those files, whereas the mayor, Mayor Wu, had said that. So, well, we by the way, I, I asked him that question and I said, have you asked your driver, uh, Detective Williams, who was involved as a cop in the case itself back in either 2005 or 2007, I forget. And he said he hasn't asked him, he doesn't have to. And I asked if he was contemplating doing an independent investigation, like Arroyo had suggested. He said no, but if there's an ethics charge filed, that would do it. Would an independent investigation not be the wisest thing for him to do quickly, Yahoo first, right here? Um, I think it would. It, it might go a long way to restoring public trust, but he could he could make one inquiry within his own office and just ask, has anybody yeah. accessed that file? Which is exactly what Mayor Wu did with the Boston police. If anybody accessed it, their login, their fingerprints would be on it. Yeah, uh, quickly, Joan, how about you? I'm a little less committed on that one. I mean, finding the leaker, I mean, finding the source of the Globe story, that kind of opens, you know, like a whole different can of worms, so to speak. Um, I, I do think he has a trust issue that he has to, you know, sort of address. I would say that um, handling and, and making sure that that transit police case is investigated yeah. should be, and maybe doing something about that first assistant, um, Mullen. Kevin Mullen, yeah. who apparently told someone that, you know, the, that he was grooming the case yeah. or he had no appetite for the case. Let's move to the statewide races. If we came, Joan, was there a dominant theme you think last night or were just a collection of different stories? Well, I've been reading on Twitter and elsewhere that the dominant theme is that progressives had a tough night last night and that it was, um, it's, only in Massachusetts would that really be the narrative, though. I mean, it, it's hard to not see Maura Healy as a progressive or Andrea Campbell as a progressive or, you know, any of the, the Democrats who won. But I do see that as a theme out there. And it's true that in the DA's race, of course, it was very complicated with all the other things that were going on with the allegations against Arroyo. But I think even absent that, um, the voters wanted someone who uh, wanted to keep people safe, not just keep a list of crimes they weren't gonna prosecute. Is that, you know, I'll tell you, yeah, well, I thought the dominant theme, if there was one, is that uh, not so many years after Shannon O'Brien was the only woman elected to statewide office in Massachusetts ever, if the Democrats who were favored in all the offices, we don't know what's gonna happen in all the races, were to win, the only male constitutional officer would be Bill Galvin as Secretary of State. That's a pretty big sea change, no? Absolutely, and Andrea Campbell would be the first black woman, yep. uh, first woman of color ever, um, you know, nominated and ever elected statewide, which is, you know, really a huge change for Massachusetts. Uh, I think uh, a real sign of progress for the state. So, you know, it, it, I mean, I think there there is a big, you know, there are big victories at the state level. It is, I think that the progressives feel particularly battered inside of Boston, but statewide, I think it's a different picture. I wanna get back to the progressive issue in a second and stay on the attorney general thing. You know, Joan, I have to say, one of uh, the things I loved about one of your columns recently is I'm sitting with Marjorie Egan saying, why do you think that Michelle Wu and uh, Senator Warren not only failed to endorse that woman who would be the first black woman statewide office holder in Massachusetts, but are relentlessly campaigning for her opponent. And then you answered the question, what, what, and by the way, they're not only uh, doing what I just said, they're also campaigning against the choice of the woman who they want to be the governor of Massachusetts, Maura Healey, who is a big Andrea Campbell fan. What was your analysis as to why they made that choice? That was one of the most fun columns I've ever written. <laughs> I mean, I, I enjoy doing it. And it, it was kind of like, to get back to the theme of women, remember that old song, it's raining men, hallelujah? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's raining women, hallelujah. And in that case, all the players were women. I mean, you had Wu and Warren and Kim Janey behind Shannon Liss Reardon, and you had um, Healy and um, Lydia Edwards and mm. other women behind Andrea Campbell. And there was kind of a petty re revenge motive, I think, going on. Campbell had run against Wu for mayor. She didn't endorse Wu when she when Wu was one of the two finalists. Um, Elizabeth Warren was not endorsed 
either by um, Andrea Campbell. Campbell had endorsed um, uh, Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. So there was all kind of little counter themes going on. By the way, there was the, the Weather end, Girls I, who did that song. It just occurred to me as you were speaking, but go right ahead. One of the great songs um, ever, go ahead. You know, in the end, I mean, there were obviously winners and losers, but wow, to see women being the power players like that. I mean, I think that says a lot about Massachusetts. And if you don't take risks, um, you can't win and sometimes you lose. You know, Yawa, I want to stay on the revenge theme because it's one of my favorites just for a second. Uh, how, does, does Campbell have a problem with Wu going forward? Does Healy have a problem with Wu going forward because of this attorney general controversy? I think they absolutely have to work together. Um, I do think, though, that in politics, if you seek an endorsement from somebody and they don't endorse you, and then they come to you for an endorsement and you give it to them, it might, you know, a lot of people might interpret that as making you look weak, like, which is to say that, you know, I don't have to endorse Michelle Wu in order to get her endorsement. Like, I don't have to give her anything and she's going to give me something. I mean, I, you know, so just to downplay the, the theme of revenge a bit, I mean, there, there's a, you know, a practical, um, consideration when you're making endorsements, receiving endorsements, not getting endorsements that, that um, you know, if you look like somebody who just gives out endorsements like party favors, then people don't have to, don't have to support you. Like, you know, there, there is a, a longstanding tradition of revenge in Massachusetts politics. There's also a, a um, longstanding tradition of, you know, sort of, um, you help me and I'll help you. You know, let's move to the governor's race for a second. As I mentioned, Jeff Deal obviously beat Chris Doty, Joan Venaki. And, you know, one of the critical issues, I think, that is going to be faced nonstop for the next nine weeks by Jeff Deal is his relationship with Donald Trump. So Marjorie Egan and I asked, I think, the obvious questions that I'm sure Jeff Deal knew coming. It's a rather long bite from our radio show today. But the first voice people will hear is Marjorie's and then Representative Deal's and then mine. Here's this back and forth about whether or not he thought the election was stolen in 2020. Here it is. Do you think uh, Joe Biden won the election? <laughs> it, look, he was certified, obviously. Uh, do you think President Biden won or not? He was certified. This is a yes or no question. Yeah. Is Joe Biden not, forget certification law, is he the legitimate president of the United He's States? He's the president right now. Of was course. the election stolen from Donald Trump, yes or no? I, yes or no? I mean, it's a simple question. I felt that there was rigging going on and it wasn't just ballots. Was I it think stolen it, from Donald Trump? You can't not answer that question for nine weeks. Well, what Jeff is Thiel. stolen? I mean, no, Jim, what is stolen? Should he be the president of the United States if. Look. The state certified it. He's Biden is the president. You know you're not answering. I mean, with I'm, all due I'm, respect, you're not answering the question. Well, I, I really don't understand the is question. Joe, I really don't. Was Joe Biden legitimately certified? He's legitimate. in the fifty states and yes, I think I answered. So that he is the legitimate times. president yes. of the United States. Okay, fine. Yeah. Okay, so he's legitimate president of the United States. Joan Vanaki went on to say he'd support Donald Trump in 2024 should he choose to run, and that he was not responsible, he being Trump, for the insurrection. Uh, can a candidate who I would argue on a lot of issues is not that much out of the Republican mainstream, he may be on Trump and he may be moderate Republican mainstream, and he may be as a, an anti-choice candidate, can he survive that kind of position on Trump? Well, this is why I'll never be a political consultant, because I would be telling him to pivot now. I mean, isn't the conventional wisdom that after you win your primary, you start to sort of reframe your message and you sort of head a little bit to the center? Um, Maura Healy certainly is doing that. She did that, you know, last night in her uh, victory speech. But for whatever the reason, Deal is marching to a different drummer. And to me, that drummer is taking him over a cliff, but he maybe he knows something we don't know. Well, you know, Yahoo, I, 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 you know, I tend to agree with Joan, but on the flip side, uh, this state has a history of liking some balance in government with the legislature virtually unanimously Democratic. I mean, almost no Republican seats. They like a little balance in the corner office. Is it? Likely that they could overlook, I mean, Trump is not popular here at all, needless to say, and abortion, the right to an abortion is very popular here. Are those things that a candidate deal can overcome or no? I don't think so. I mean, Trump lost, you know, by a landslide in Massachusetts. Republican presidential candidates generally do quite poorly here. 
you know, throughout history. And I, I don't think there's been as much, and, and enough has changed in Massachusetts in order for Deal to, to overcome that. I agree with Joan, like, you know, if he, if, I, I'm not sure what his end game is. If he were focused on winning, I think he would have pivoted and you know, become more, more of the moderate that, you know, Republican that has traditionally won in Massachusetts. You know, speaking of moderate and speaking of what you said at the top of the show, Joan, about uh, some progressives being unhappy with the Democratic slate, I, you mentioned uh, that there were a couple of things that Maura Healy said last night that may have caused that feeling. Here are two that I think most of us identified. Here's Maura Healy during her victory speech last night. Governor Baker has led with respect and worked with both parties. He's refused to engage in the politics of division and destruction that we've seen across this country. I thank him for that and for his service to this state. The people voted recently to give everyone in the state tax relief if the state had excess revenue. And it looks like we do. So the people should get that money back as soon as possible. And without giving people a headache, a lot of progressives think that tax cap from 1986, instead of giving the $3 billion back in a fairly inequitable way to the taxpayers, should be invested in things that, services that matter, or at least returned in a more equitable way. That's the kind of pivoting uh, that you were talking about that Democrats and Republicans generally do, but you suggest the deal did not, no? Absolutely. I mean, Maura Healy knows that Charlie Baker's favorability right now is 73%. People of Massachusetts like him. They like the way he governed. They like what he stands for. And tax relief is one of those things. And it's true. We've got all this money. There's a law. And if you don't like the law, repeal it. I mean, that's that's what I would say. You know, we only have a couple of seconds left. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll quote from Joan Vanaki for Joan Vanaki. She wrote a column about the Massachusetts miracle being Charlie Baker at 73% after a woman had to jump into the mystic to escape a fire on the orange line, mentioned deadly bureaucratic screw-ups at the RMV, DCF, the Holyoke Soldiers Home. Are you surprised that at the end of a second term after that, this governor's essentially loved by the people of Massachusetts? Are you asking me? <laughs> no, I, I read you. I said what you said. I'm asking Yahoo. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I mean, it doesn't square with my own sense, but I, I think Joan Vanaki nailed it when she said he's tall. Um, I think that's what voters <laughs> like. Um, but he's very, you know, the, I think that was the last line, but he's very tall uh, uh, from a column a few years back. Um, hey, Yahoo. I'm very tall and you should read my text and email. You wouldn't feel the same way. Hey, Joan Vanaki and uh, Yahoo Miller, I really appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you. I should note two Democratic contested races we didn't mention. Bill Galvin wins for Secretary of State and Senator Diana DiZaglio is the nominee for Auditor. That's it for tonight. Please come back tomorrow. More COVID boosters, fewer COVID restrictions, and plenty of confusion to go around. What do you need to know about the latest new norms about COVID? We'll discuss that more tomorrow at 7. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget Ukraine.